Today we're going to take a look at Tennessee's fourth round pick, Des Fitzpatrick. I'm going to breeze through some stats to start off so you can pause the video if you're interested. But in 2020, Fitzpatrick had 43 catches for 831 yards and an average depth of target of 14.1 yards downfield. He averaged 2.49 yards per route run and he played almost exclusively on the outside. Fitzpatrick is a receiver with pretty well-defined strengths and weaknesses that show themselves when you look at his route distribution. In 2020, about 15% of his routes were in-breaking routes like slants or digs, and his points above average per route was 0.292. Points above average, by the way, is a metric from Sports Info Solutions that essentially quantifies a player's efficiency compared to the average player in that situation. Outbreaking routes made up 16.4% of his routes, and he had a PAA per route of .208. And you can see that he was much less efficient on routes that broke horizontally because his lateral movement skills aren't that great, but his acceleration and physicality off the line of scrimmage make him a really good vertical threat, whether that's on stop routes like curls and comebacks, which made up 34% of his route tree, or on deep routes, which he ran 18.4% of the time. I want to start by looking at a few of Des Fitzpatrick's releases. So right here, he's got what looks like man or match coverage. Even if it ends up being a split safety defense, he has the slot wide receiver running a dig route, which should push the safety inside. So he knows that he wants to get an inside release here. His inside foot is forward in his stance, which is pretty standard. And so his first step, he's gonna bring the outside foot forward to bring himself to balance and give him a two-way go. As he does this, he bends his knees more to give him better acceleration in either direction. At this point, he has two things to worry about. First of all, he wants to release inside, so he knows that he needs to turn the defensive back in the opposite direction. And the corner's most likely gonna be jamming him at some point, so he needs to defend himself from that. There's really three components of this release. First of all, he's gonna flip his hips outside, and then he's gonna drag the inside foot in and then up. So what do these three things do? Flipping the hips outside draws out the jam with the outside hand. If you fully extend your arm out, your body's naturally gonna adjust its weight displacement in the opposite direction. So giving a hard sell to the outside gets the DB on his heels. As he's making his first motion, he's dipping his inside shoulder forward and moving his outside shoulder back. If you give a good press corner access to your entire chest when he's trying to jam you, it doesn't matter how nice your footwork is, you're probably not getting anywhere. And you see the corner actually lands the jam, but not with any force, so Des isn't really phased by that at all. And then once you turn a corner's hips, you gotta transition into trying to stack him, and that's what the inside leg is doing here. If you get a cornerback leaning too far in one direction, he's most likely gonna counter jam with the other hand, and you need to generate enough burst to accelerate through that second jam. That's what Des is trying to do with his inside leg, is drive up and through the contact while maintaining a straight trajectory. The main issue is that he sort of drags the inside foot and he isn't able to cover much ground with the step, so he doesn't really put himself in a position to stack the corner. Overall, it's a really good release, but he just needs to finish it better. On this play again, he brings himself to balance and he lets the corner make the first move, but he keeps his hands high and active in case the corner is super aggressive with his jam. He's just gonna shuffle his feet, the corner takes a false step with the outside foot, and then he has great reaction to release inside. Then it's just speed and attacking the deep shoulder to stack him downfield. Here he's gonna do the same release as the last play, but he's gonna add a double move. So like always, he brings his outside foot forward and squares up. He's gonna shuffle to freeze the defender. And he's not as much trying to turn his hips, he's more trying to sort of paralyze the corner for a couple seconds so that he can attack the shoulder on a straight line path. Once he decides to move forward, he's leading with the outside arm so that he can protect himself against a jam and start to stack as soon as possible. Right here, he squares up, but then immediately he takes a powerful inside step, flips his body at a 45 degree angle to give the corner a smaller target for the jam, and then he releases vertically. And then right here, he does a nice hesitation move into an outside release, and then a really nice adjustment on the back shoulder throw. 
Every release a receiver uses at the line of scrimmage is meant to accomplish a similar goal, but there's a ton of different paths that you can take to get there. The more release variations a receiver has at their disposal, the more difficult it becomes for a cornerback to consistently press them, and Des Fitzpatrick does a really good job of attacking DBs in a bunch of different ways. This is the main thing that sets him apart from other receivers you describe as raw athletic projects because usually their release packages won't be nearly as refined. Even though he's really consistent at getting off the line of scrimmage, when it comes to stacking the corner and creating separation down the field, he's a bit more hit or miss. And I think his pro day testing sort of backs this up because you see he has really good numbers in the 10 and 20 yard split, but his 40 time isn't as great in comparison, so he doesn't really have the elite top end speed while he does have elite burst and acceleration. His three cone and shuttle time also shed some light on an area where he isn't as good, which is routes that break horizontally. He's not great at creating separation off of quick lateral cuts, and he only really had success on these types of routes against off coverage. When the corner wasn't spotting him 8 yards of separation to start the route, he wasn't able to win that often, and for an offense like Tennessee's that attacks the middle of the field so heavily, Fitzpatrick will need to improve a lot in this area to get open consistently. His ability after the catch should help him fit in. Among receivers drafted ahead of him, he was 5th in avoided tackles per reception and 4th in yards after the catch per reception. He's six foot two with good speed and play strength, and he has long arms. And if he can develop the ability to get open consistently over the middle, he could replace some of the yak production that Tennessee lost with Jonu Smith and Corey Davis. The biggest weakness on Des Fitzpatrick's film is actually catching the ball, and this shows up in the form of focus drops and ball skills on contested catches. If we compare him again to the receivers drafted before him, Fitzpatrick had the third lowest catch percentage at 58.9%. And catch percentage is just how often do you catch the ball when you're targeted, so that can depend a lot on external factors like how accurate is your quarterback, how much separation are you creating, stuff like that. But his drop percentage was 10.4%, which was second lowest out of this group, and his catch percentage on contested targets was just middle of the road at 42%. The two main things I look for when a receiver has drop issues is technique and hand size. He's actually pretty good about attacking the ball with his arms extended rather than body catching, but there are a lot of times that he turns his eyes upfield too early before securing the catch. And then his hand size was the only pro day measurable that wasn't above average, and smaller hands just makes it a lot harder to be consistent catching the ball. That's not to say that his hands are tiny or that hand size is going to make or break you as a receiver, but drop issues are one of the more difficult things to really analyze for a receiver, and hand size is kind of one of the few things that we really have to go off of. When it comes to adjusting to the ball down the field, Fitzpatrick will have plays where he looks like Kenny Galladay and plays that he looks like Nelson Aguilar. He has the frame and athleticism where he could be good in these situations, but he just doesn't show it consistently enough. Fitzpatrick's ability to sink his hips and stop makes him really effective on curls and comebacks, and watching his tapes, those were the routes where it seemed to me like he was getting the most consistent separation. Most tall receivers that don't have great lateral athleticism also struggle to start and stop like this, so his skill set is definitely unique. There are probably other receivers I would have gone with in the fourth round, and I would not have traded up to get him, but I don't hate the pick at all. Like with anyone you get on day 3, Fitzpatrick has a handful of strengths and a handful of weaknesses, and whether or not he can improve on those weaknesses will determine whether or not he succeeds in the NFL. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe for more film breakdowns.